Hi, it's Gary, and in this episode, I hope you'll join me on a six-day wild adventure to the Guitar Foundation of America International Convention and Competition, which is arguably the largest and most prestigious classical guitar festival in the world. And as for me professionally as a luthier, it's one of the most important activities that I can do every year to demo my guitars in the Vendor Expo, get feedback, and support my brand. Now this is a very special GFA convention because while it normally travels all around the country year to year, this one happens to be a special one in that, number one, it's in New York City, which is just 20 minutes that way, and it is also celebrating the GFA's 50th anniversary. So they're going to roll out all kinds of great concerts and special activities in celebration of the GFA's 50th. But I want to take you along and show you what it's like maybe from a luthier's perspective. But I, I always go to these conventions with the point of view that I'm a member of the classical guitar community who happens to build guitars. So I can enjoy just like everybody else and contribute in a slightly different way. But everybody who attends the convention has something to give, whether they're a player, composer, teacher, luthier, string manufacturer, we all have a role. And that's what makes this convention so special year in and year out. So there are a couple things that I need to do to prepare, and that is to finish a guitar that I'll be demoing. And so I'll take you through the final stages of that process, and then we'll pack up and head to Manhattan. So let's get going. The most important thing that I can do to prep for the GFA convention is to complete a guitar that I'll demo at the Vendor Expo. So I've got a nice guitar here in the final stages, and what's left to do is to do a few more passes of French Palace shellac, and then glue the bridge, which I'll use uh, hot hide glue and a vacuum press. And then I'll do a com preliminary construction of the nut and saddle install the tuners and then string it up with a preliminary setup. So let's get started on this. Here I'm applying the final amounts of shellac which is dissolved in ethyl alcohol and applied to a pad with lubricating olive oil. And once it's passed over, it's dry to the touch. So it's more like an amalgamation process more than applying any kind of coat. The last step in constructing the guitar is to glue the bridge, so here I am drilling the holes and getting it ready to glue. Here's the process of gluing the bridge, and I'm using hot hide glue, which is animal collagen dissolved in heated water. And at 140 degrees, the collagen is more like a gel, but when it dries, it will be crystalline and hard. You'll see how the footprint of the bridge is masked off on the body. I've got the bridge masked to keep it clean, and then I'll apply the glue and then put it under a vacuum press, which is a frame that has a rubber gasket and rubber membrane that will pull the, the bridge down onto the soundboard for a couple of hours. But after about eight minutes of the bridge seated with the vacuum press, I remove the vacuum press and do some cleanup first and then put the vacuum press back on for the two hours.
While the bridge is gluing, I can start constructing the saddle and the nut, which are made out of cow bone. And then by the next day, I can start the actual setup and stringing. All right, we're ready to go. I've got a roughed out nut and saddle, and we're ready to string. And no matter how many times you string a new guitar, it never gets old. And it's also a really nice time because I pre-stretch strings on the very first guitar that I ever built. And it's a nice way to remember the journey that I've been on and how much I've improved in over 20 years of building guitars. So let me get the strings off of this old guitar and put them on the new one. I always start with the first string because on a classical guitar it's the most difficult to build a beautiful sounding first string, so that's the string that I'm most interested in. I'm always interested in hearing how even the notes play across the string, and in this case, right off the bat, no hot spots, no dead notes, so this is really good. And then I like to look at the sixth string to see how deep the bass response is, and that will give me a, an indication of how rich the sound is going to be. And this one is very good, too. Okay, I'm liking what I'm hearing so far, which is really satisfying, especially since there was about 200 hours of contact time with this guitar, so finally getting to this point is really always a thrill. And uh, a lot of people always ask me, how does it sound? How does it sound? And it's kind of a joke, but I always say, it sounds like one of my guitars. And, and that's really the truth, because after building so many of them and knowing that if I take care of the physical parameters and monitor them throughout the whole process and steer the resonances to how I want them, when I get to this point, it's really not a surprise on how it sounds. And so I, I think that's just a reflection of taking care of the details throughout the, the construction process that will get you to this point. And all of these physical parameters are correlated with the sound output of an enormous number of guitars that I've built so far.
Well, I'm all set to go, and the guitar is done, and I think it's a very nice one. It's very representative of my work, and I'm super eager to hear what people have to say about it and hear how different players sound on it, and so ready to pack that up. And the other thing that I have that's very important is a box full of different things I'll need for the vendor expo, and I'll ship it directly to the vendor site, and it's got things like a tablecloth for my vendor table, guitar stand, footstools, a bunch of strings for string changes, and a lot of tools because I've found over the years that players often need to have some of their problems diagnosed, especially those that are in competition, and always some adjustments need to be made on guitars, so it's always handy to have some rudimentary tools on hand to help people out. So the only thing left to do is to take the box to the shipper and pack up and get on the bus and head to Manhattan. Well, we made it into Manhattan, and this is just a couple of blocks from the bus terminal that brought us into the city, and it never fails to stun me how incredible it is that I could be in wooded suburban northern New Jersey, and then half an hour later, I could be in a really intense urban environment like this. But I wanted to start here because with this amusement-like atmosphere in Times Square, it shows you how intense New York City can be, but we're here for a classical guitar, which will be a completely different type of environment. And just a little bit about New York City in terms of guitar, it's held a very distinct uh, place in guitar history because a lot of the great guitar players not only came through to to concertize in places like Carnegie Hall or Lincoln Center or the 92nd Street Y. They also taught here and a lot of training goes on at some of the major music conservatories in the world based here in New York City such as the Juilliard School, the Manus School of Music where we'll spend one day at the conclusion of the GFA and the Manhattan School of Music who is hosting this year's GFA convention. And I think for that reason, a lot of guitarists train here and then they continue to stay here using New York City as their base to go off and concertize or teach. And it's just a very stimulating place to be as uh, an artist, no matter what your vocation is, music, dance, uh, visual arts, film arts, and, and, and so forth. So a little bit about the GFA convention. It's primarily centered around classical guitar performance and education. And it's not really any uh, thing that's, uh, that is built around luthery, unlike some shows that you might have in the steel string world in the classical guitar world, those type of shows really don't happen. So that's why luthery and guitar builders are just the small slice of what will happen. But an important thing that's going to happen on uh, Thursday, day four of the festival, is we'll hear uh, in a comparative setting, we will hear a blinded test of luthier built guitars played by concert guitarists in a concert hall 
and uh, I'll tell you more about that as that comes up, but it's a pretty important event for the Luthiers, as is the uh, vendor exposition where players can come and try all the different guitars. This year there will be 20 Luthiers, most of whom are my friends and just a great gathering and celebration of the art of Luthery. But performance is the big thing for the GFA. Every day there's at least two major concerts in this being a special celebration of the 50th anniversary of the GFA, it will be a star-studded lineup of past GFA competition winners. Speaking of the GFA competition, one of the main things that happens at the GFA convention is that it holds the most prestigious playing competition in the world in that if you win, it's like winning the gold medal at the Guitar Olympics and it's broken up into different divisions, the International Concert Artist Competition, which is the adult competition, which is the main event, and then also an international ensemble competition, and one of the most prestigious youth competitions, ranging in age from four, uh, 14 and younger for the junior division, and from 15 to 18 years of age for the senior division. And the finals of the youth competition is happening tonight. So that's a little overview of what we can look forward to this week. And so now we need to get a subway and head uptown about 70 blocks to the Manhattan School of Music and check into the hotel where I'll be staying this week. So we'll see you over there. Manhattan School of Music is on Broadway Street, five miles north of where we started in Times Square. It's near the vibrant and historic Harlem neighborhood across the street from Columbia University. This seven-story building was the first home of the Juilliard School before Juilliard moved to Lincoln Center in Midtown. The guitar program was started by New York guitar icon Rolando Valdez Blaine along with Manuel Barueco. Renowned guitarists like the late Carlos Barbosa Lima and Sharon Isbin taught here, and the current roster of professors reads like a Hall of Fame list. Mark Del Priora, David Starobin, David Leisner, and Oren Fader. The school's facilities excel in all the things that a GFA convention requires. A large concert hall for the main concerts and competition finals, a medium-large hall for competition early rounds, a medium-small jewel box style hall for master classes, lectures, and the Luthier Showcase, an open performance space for things like technique workshops, and multi-purpose rooms such as band rooms for the vendor fair. What's interesting from a Luthier's perspective is that over the course of the week, each setting will present the sound and capability of guitars slightly differently, ranging from highly intimate, nuanced, and easy to hear in the small venues to sometimes straining to hear if without amplification in the large hall. It can be a challenge to build guitars that can fill a five to 600 seat hall if the acoustics aren't good, but fortunately at MSM, the acoustics are excellent. Let's dive into the festival now, and as you can see from the schedule, it is six days of nonstop classical guitar, and it is heaven for the classical guitar enthusiast. On most days, it runs from 9 a.m. until 10 p.m., and that's not even including the social hours that happen after each evening. The festival kicked off on the evening of day one with an absolutely riveting competition featuring the two divisions of the youth competition. <music> playing the same concert level guitars that the seasoned professionals are playing and their modern guitars filled the hall no problem unamplified. 
On the morning of day two, the vendor expo began and ran through the rest of the festival. Here you can see the wide variety of luthiers, strings, sheet music, and accessories available, with vendors coming from all around the world. The expo was held in two adjacent rooms, and from this view from my table, you can get a feel of the swirling atmosphere in the room. It's a blend of instrument trial room, a meeting place to catch up with old and new friends, and a very fun and relaxed environment to take a break from the intensity of the rest of the festival. For the luthiers, it's a chance to introduce people to their instruments, check in with players that have their instruments, and talk shop with fellow luthiers. The most rewarding experience is for me to observe how different players sound on my guitars and get their impressions. It can get loud in the rooms, so often you retreat to hallways and classrooms to get some quiet. If you remember those tools I packed, well, they got a lot of use. Some of the work I helped people with included a lot of action adjustments, fret dressing, French polishing, and even supplying emergency super glue for broken nails. Glancing at the schedule again, you can see that the variety of daily activities makes the festival truly a buffet of classical guitar. Each day starts at 9 a.m. with a hands-on technique workshop led by one of the luminaries of guitar, such as this one led by Antigoni Goni. Then moving into the mid-morning, you can catch one of the lectures and then a master class. And one of the master classes taught by Jason Vio gave me an opportunity to hear one of my guitars in very capable hands and observe how this young friend of mine uses the capabilities of the instrument. Following Amelia's masterclass, we decided to further optimize her guitar's action, and that's just one of the great perks for luthiers to see people in person at guitar events like this. In this wondrous buffet of guitar activities, the main course is served twice a day in the form of featured concerts. While I can't show footage from them, looking at the all-star lineup, you can imagine what a treat each concert was. In celebration of the GFA's 50th anniversary, the majority of concerts featured past GFA competition winners, with typically three of them per concert. While you might think that a premier classical guitar festival would stick to straight-ahead classical, the GFA always pushes the boundaries and sprinkles in a lot of diversity, which I think is great because I love being introduced to new things. We heard genres like world music, a high-octane ensemble of electric guitar in Steve Reich's Electric Counterpoint, and progressive fingerstyle steel string guitar. It's a great reminder that guitar is one of the world's most popular instruments because of its many different styles, voices, and traditions. In speaking about the sound of classical guitars needing to fill a 600-seat auditorium, I think in about half the concerts, the sound of the guitars was amplified, very subtly and tastefully so, so that I never felt that I was straining to hear the sound of the guitar even in the very back row. Day four brought the much-anticipated Luthier Showcase, which gives Luthiers the opportunity to submit one of their guitars to be played by two world-class concert players in a concert hall setting. It's not a competition, but more of a comparative listening session for the Luthiers and audience members, particularly good for those who want to purchase one of the instruments at the vendor fair. Nonetheless, it's a superhuman demonstration on the part of the players because they have to play the same passages over and over on 24 guitars. They have to play it perfectly and try to get the most out of each guitar. And this year's players are Lovro Peretic from Croatia and Ravshan Mamakuliev from Azerbaijan. They're both past GFA winners.
And for the audience members and for the luthiers, it's so fascinating to hear the subtleties among a big collection of guitars and try to pick apart what are some of the attributes of different designs or makers' uh, approaches. The Luthier Showcase is one of the very rare opportunities to hear different guitars in a controlled setting. One of the controls that's built into this event is that the builders' names are not revealed until the conclusion of the event. The guitars are only identified by number, which can be matched later to a list. This helps prevent any psychological bias during the listening session. For me, the showcase is a real highlight because it's the proof of the pudding moment when my guitars are really put to the test and I can hear how they perform. And there is some interesting thought that I have to put into the showcase as far as all the way back to when I'm building a guitar. I want to make it easy for them to play when they jump onto this guitar that they've never tried before. So. I don't want to make a scale length too long, and I don't want to make it oddly too short either, so it just has to be perfect. And the one that I put into the showcase has a very medium scale length, 644 millimeters. I also want to set the action correctly, such that it's not too low so that it's buzzing if they play a very loud passage, but then not too high that it's difficult for them to play once they just jump onto it. And then I have to consider the strings. I want enough nuance and character in the string, but I also want it to be loud with good projection. So I usually go with nylon on the first and second string, fluorocarbon on the third string, and high tension all the way around on the bass and trebles. The event starts about an hour before showtime with the luthiers <laughs> submitting their instruments and then they get tagged with their ID numbers. And then everybody files into the hall. There's a lot of anticipation, excitement, and a bit of nervousness. Mark, how do you feel? <laughs> Aaron, Tony? It's going to be awesome. There's positive attitude for you right there. I like that. Miller Hall was a really good choice for the venue because it's a medium-sized hall with very clean and neutral acoustics. At this point, the GFA staff is madly tuning each guitar right before they go on stage.
Here's the list of builders that was revealed at the end of the showcase. And in this year's showcase, just like those in the past, all the guitars were of superb quality and demonstrated a large diversity of voices and tonal and visual aesthetics. That's great news for players because it means that any player can find a great match to his or her playing style. Construction-wise, I estimate that about one half of the guitars were of traditional solid top construction, while the other half were modern, comprised of double tops or lattice braced soundboards. And this reflects the trend I've observed over the last 10 years towards a higher proportion of modern style guitars. And this raises the intriguing question of who's driving this type of movement, the players or the builders? And while I think it's both, I think it's predominantly the players who dictate their needs for a performance tool and do a type of natural selection by buying certain instruments that meets their criteria. It's up to the builders to interpret the need and construct instruments with the designs they think will best serve these needs. Showcases are not a complete representation of the Luthery world, but they do provide a window into the trends. And I want to give a big thanks to Francisco Venegas and the GFA volunteers who ran a flawless showcase that was both illuminating and fun for all. Through the course of the week, the International Concert Artists Competition whittled the 61 competitors down to 12 after the preliminary round, and then to 4 after the semi-final round. By the last night of the festival, the atmosphere at all GFAs becomes electric when the finals roll around. I'll have some commentary on the results at the end of the video, but here's a taste of the performances that gives you a sense of the current state of classical guitar. The festival concluded with the induction of New Yorker Sharon Isbin into the GFA Hall of Fame for artistic achievement. She broke a lot of ground for everyone in the classical guitar world. I'm especially grateful to her for very kindly inviting me to Juilliard in the past to have her and her students play my guitars. That interconnectedness among different people in the New York City guitar community is one of the neat things about being in the area. All in all, this GFA convention was one of the best I've ever attended. I don't know if it will ever return to New York City because of the considerable expense, but everyone who attended seemed to realize that it was one for the history books. So now we're going to head from the Harlem neighborhood, which is near the Manhattan School of Music, and we're going to head all the way downtown to the Manus School of Music, where the New York Guitar Seminar is kicking off tonight. And we're going to hear a concert by my friend Jalil Refik Kaya. So let's hop on the subway again and start heading downtown. Well, here we are at the Manus School of Music, which is in its new home in Greenwich Village. The old Manus School was in the Upper West Side, which is about halfway between here and where we were at the Manhattan School of Music. And it's really one of the great guitar programs in New York City with great professors such as Michael Newman and Fred Hand. And you might know some of their recent graduates, including Joao Luis of the 
Brazil guitar duo and Jalil Rafiq Kaya, who we'll hear tonight, who is now back in this area after getting a doctorate at uh, UT Austin, and he now teaches at uh, schools in New Jersey. So it's a real homecoming for Jalil, and Manus has always been like a second home for me when I'm in New York City. I've interacted with a lot of the professors and the students over the years, so let's go inside. Manus has the distinction of being the first music school in the U.S. to offer a degree in classical guitar. Its facilities are beautiful and modern, and the New York Guitar Seminar, run by Michael Newman and Laura Altman, is a 23-year-old summer tradition known for its warmth and giving its participants highly personal attention. It's a smaller gathering than, say, the GFA convention, and in this setting, everyone is treated like family. It's another great example of how New York City offers some of the best in classical guitar. Well, we've come to the end of a fantastic week here in New York City, and I thought I would do a recap for you on the High Line, which is in the Chelsea neighborhood. The High Line is one of the treasures of New York City. It used to be the railroad tracks that would bring the cattle into the meatpacking district of Chelsea, and it's been converted into a pedestrian walkway park with fantastic views of the city. And so just recapping what happened last night at Jalil Rafiq Kaya's concert, it was a spectacular exhibition of how you can marry phenomenal technique with real human heart and expressiveness. And it was just so great to see Jalil performing at his alma mater, Manus. And as a guitar builder, it's been such a pleasure to work with him over the years, learning the needs of a professional guitarist and literally trying to keep up with his abilities. And so he's taught me a lot about guitar building and what needs to go into guitars. Recapping what happened at the GFA, I think I should start with what is the future of guitar, and that is the youth. The youth, as evidenced by the competitions that they had, they are progressing at an exponential rate compared to even five years ago their technical ability is really approaching that of the seasoned professionals, and it really remains to be seen how well they can express themselves artistically. But even at the 14-year-old and 18-year-old range, many of them have that gift. And as we saw with the first prize winner in the 18 and under category, she put on an incredible display of virtuosity and artistry that anyone would be happy to pay money to go see one of her concerts. Marco Topchi from the Ukraine won the ICAC division of the competition and he has been a crowd favorite for a long time and his gold medal winning performance was truly mind-blowing. He showed superhuman virtuosity on the technical level but also an incredible high level on a different plane of expressiveness, human quality that combined made for a really compelling first place win. And speaking about the instruments themselves, the instruments that were presented by my colleague Luthiers, they were superb and it shows how the guitar players are pushing us to create guitars that can really keep up with them. And any number of the guitars that were presented at the exposition, I would be happy to take home myself. As far as my own guitars, I was very pleased about the feedback that I received. And one of the guitars that I made for demonstration purposes was taken home by one of my friends, and I couldn't be happier about that. But in terms of the feedback that I received, it was very strong, and I'm very happy about that. But most importantly, the, the constructive feedback that I got from them, which is most helpful to me as a builder, and those came in many different types of forms, one-on-one -on -one when players would be playing them, but often we would have ch a chance to hear them together with several people playing and listening in a quiet room, and that is always the most constructive, especially when you 
you can get excellent players, and in some cases, uh, even recording and audio engineers to really describe in words and demonstration what we are actually hearing. And I brought two guitars that were purposely voiced slightly differently. And while the construction was very subtle and the result was very subtle, technically I had one guitar that had a, a higher flexibility in the cross grain direction, perpendicular to the string that is, which had more of a reverberant quality. And then another guitar that had uh, higher stiffness in that cross grain direction, which gives a cleaner sound. And sure enough, different players responded to, the, to that differently. And about 50-50, right down the middle, different players preferred one over the other. And so now I know that I can build either, or at least for my clients, I can ask them what do they prefer and even have them try the, the, the different ones and select from there. What is always fascinating to me is to observe how different players relate and perceive different guitars. And I've mentioned in previous videos how it's more about the match. Can a guitar match the playing and personality of the player? And this week was a really good demonstration of how that happens. And the way that you can tell is just the body language, the way that play, different players play on different guitars, you can tell when they are extremely comfortable and uh, really latch on to the personality of that particular guitar so that when the match is made, it is one seamless bond between player and instrument. That's going to do it from New York City, and I thank you for joining me on this week-long adventure the GFA always symbolically marks the end of my Luthery year in building, and it was a great time to celebrate the accomplishments of the past year. And then it marks the, the symbolic beginning of the next year, and is always fills me with a lot of inspiration, the encouragement of players, and thoughts about how I can improve, because that's really what it's about. And so I'm going to head back to New Jersey. And in the future, I will meet you back at the workshop. But I thank you for coming along on this trip.